Hey everybody, welcome back to the channel today. We are back again here in Pasadena at the Ninth Circuit Court of Appeals. Today we heard oral arguments for the Boland v. Bonta case and arguing on behalf of CRPA and with us today we have Aaron Murphy. Aaron, how are you? Doing well, thanks. Awesome. Thank you very much for being here. Thank you for taking the time with us today. Uh, I just wanted to go over a couple of things. First of all, what is your feeling walking out of the courtroom? How did that go today? Well, you know, it's always hard to predict with courts, but the court spent a lot of time listening to our arguments, gave us a good chance to really dig into these issues, and they listened to what we had to say. So you can't ask for a lot more than that. I couldn't agree more. I also feel like there were a couple of things that were really harped on by the panel of judges. Uh, but before I get to those two, th I mean, those two things uh, being the, the technology and how it and how it's prevalent or, or at least how it applies to the, the history, uh, as well as the uh, the proving laws uh, looking back in history. Also, something that I thought was interesting, though, when uh, the state was arguing, uh, he made he made a point to try and state that California was really not a, an exception uh, to any of these things. The Unsafe Handgun Act has nothing to do with possession. Um, well, I mean, it somewhat does. You can't, if you can't buy them, you can't possess them. Uh, correct, but it does not, um, it does not restrict possession of, 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 of Austria guns, but I, yes, I see your point. That, that is correct. Um, and I, I can talk about why California is also not an outlier for the modern. Uh, regulation. The, the, the panel kind of came back at him and said, well, are there any other states that are doing this? Uh, why is it important for the state to prove that these laws in, that were challenging in the Bolin case doesn't make California an outlier? Yeah, I, I think this is one of the harder arguments for the state to try and say California is not an outlier here because it really is the only state in the country that demands these three particular features to be on all semi-automatic handguns. And you know, that matters because Bruin tells us that we're supposed to be looking at the traditions of this country. And you have to look at historical traditions, but there's also the question of even if in modern day nobody is doing what California is doing, you know, that raises questions in and of itself, especially when two of the features at issue here, the Chamberlain indicators and the magazine disconnect mechanism, these are features, this is technology that's been around for a hundred years, yet we don't have any other state mandating that firearms have this technology in order to be sold. Right, and so so let's focus on those really quick because when the state was arguing, tried to make the connection to the proving laws dating back to the 1800s, I think it was in Massachusetts. You raised an issue that I was going to ask about, which was the, the outlier point. Is California an outlier on this today in terms of imposing these restrictions? And if so, does it, in your view, does it matter? The short answer is, is no, that California is not an outlier. Um, so firearms are outside the federal jurisdiction of the Consumer Product Safety Commission. And so consistent with McDonald, states have, um, have you know, devised social solutions and come up with reasonable firearm regulations. And California has done that here to ensure that the firearms that are commercially sold are not defective and do not um, to the best extent, do not accidentally discharge. And how many so, How many other states have the CLI and MDM requirements? So Massachusetts has a requirement that it has a chamber load indicator or a magazine disconnect mechanism. Massachusetts and Maryland have handgun rosters, as does Washington, D.C. Handgun what? I'm sorry. Handgun rosters. Oh, so like California has the roster. Right. Uh, Maryland and Massachusetts and Washington, D.C. also have rosters. Um, as I mentioned earlier, New York and New Jersey also have micro-stamping requirements. I think New York and Massachusetts also have... Well, they don't have micro-stamping requirements. Well, they have micro-stamping requirements. Have, they, have, they have attempts to just determine whether they're going to have micro-stamping requirements. Correct. I would say they're not in effect. They're not in effect yet. But does any state have both CLI and MDM requirements besides California? No. California is the only one that requires both. Can you tell us really quick, what were those proving laws that they were talking about in Massachusetts, and how is it that they don't actually apply to what we're challenging here? Sure. I think the best way to think about proving laws is that they're kind of early product defect laws. They were saying, you, if you're going to sell firearms, you have to ensure that they do what a firearm is supposed to do. So they tested their ability to fire, that, that, that when you pulled the trigger, they would fire and, you know, not malfunction or blow up in your face. And then they tested whether they could fire a certain distance. So it was typically, you know, 70, 75 yards, whatever was sort of the standard. So it was essentially like a quality control of 
this is what people expect in a firearm, so we're only going to allow you to sell firearms that actually live up to those expectations. That's really different from what we have here because the features that California has mandated are not common in firearms. In fact, most handguns that are sold don't have either of these features, let alone both of them, at least if you accept California's really demanding conception of a chamber load indicator. And so what the state's doing is not so much testing, you know, to ensure that firearms operate how consumers expect them to operate, but instead trying to alter firearms to operate in ways that consumers don't expect or may not even want them to operate when it comes to something like a magazine disconnect mechanism. Kind of rolling that into consumer expectations, the, the court asked some questions relating to technology and, and how things uh, can be made available and how things have been made available since uh, you know the founding of this country. The threshold question is simply designed to basically ask, are you restricting the right to keep and bear arms? And if the state passes a law that says, we're going to take a bunch of arms and say you can't buy them, I mean, it, it, it would seem sort of extraordinary to me to think that that wouldn't even implicate the just, Second just Amendment Just to understand, what's, uh, what's the purpose of, of that evolution of technology, at least in the line of questioning to you? Sure. So, you know, I think there's always a desire to make our position seem like it's some extreme position that anything that's new could never survive simply because Bruin's a historical test. And I don't think that's right. I mean, Bruin itself acknowledges, of course, there will be things that are truly new technology, and we have to analyze them with that in mind, but we still have to analyze them against history. And what matters is whether new technology or developments are being used to impose much more severe burdens than historically were accepted on the right. And that's where you get to that real difference between something like the old proving laws, which basically said, look, you can purchase any common firearm as long as it's been proven not to be defective, whereas the operation of this law is to say, you can't purchase the most some of the most common firearms in the country simply because they don't have features that California thinks that a firearm should have. And then I guess the, the final thought, you know, before, uh, you know, you argued Boland today, uh, they were arguing the Rena v. Bonta case. Uh, they were referencing Boland a lot. And I think that's exactly what the state kind of wants to elide here. You know, take something like the magazine disconnect mechanism. I mean, that, you know, the state wants to just call it a safety feature. It's actually a feature that, that alters the operation of a handgun. It means that somebody who wants to fire the round in the chamber cannot do so. Most, you know, many people, including law enforcement all throughout California, they, they want firearms that can fire the round in the chamber in the event you have a problem with the magazine, if the magazine comes out or whatever it may be. Uh, in, in the argument specifically to the state, uh, can, can you tell us, I mean, does that have any weight or impact on uh, the Boland case and how the judges are looking at it when they're already using it, or at least the arguments that we have in other cases? Yeah, I think some of the reason a little bit more focus today was on Boland is because we had a more developed record here. We put on um, testimony from numerous witnesses below to explain why microstamping isn't feasible, why people wouldn't want a magazine disconnect mechanism, why a chamber load indicator of the type that California demands isn't the type of thing consumers want. And so, you know, the state was, uh, the court was focused on that record and particularly focused on how there wasn't really much of a record on um, that just given the way the state presented its case in Rena, There was a little bit less of a record from the state in our case, but, um, but we certainly uh, endeavored to make our case to the lower court and the district court agreed with us and made some factual findings that we were correct about uh, the infeasibility and uncommonality of the features that California is mandating. Gotcha. Absolutely. Well, I, I really appreciate you taking the time with us. I think we have some winning arguments here. Uh, I can't wait to see what the decision comes out uh, when it comes out from the court and maybe see where the lawsuit goes beyond that. Aaron, thank you very much for taking the time with me. I appreciate it. My pleasure. And if you like these videos and content like this, we're going to be looking to do it a lot more. I might even call it the layman and the lawyer series since that's what it really is. Uh, but we're really looking to educate people on how these lawsuits are moving throughout the, the court system. So go ahead, drop a like, subscribe to the channel. It really helps with the algorithms. Thanks again, guys. We'll see you on the next one.